All right, everybody. Welcome back to another episode of the Crypto 101 podcast. We are excited to be here. Uh, you guys know me. I'm Bryce, and you know our good, wonderful compadre, Mr. Brendan Veeman. Uh, how are you doing, Brendan? Doing good, as per usual. Uh, there's a lot to talk about in the crypto markets, especially right now. Mm -hmm. So I'm doing pretty great. I hope all the listeners are doing equally as well. But man, excited for another podcast, Bryce. Absolutely. Yeah, a lot of volatility. Um, you know, the political climate seems to be changing. Um, recently watched the uh, the Trump speech in Nashville about how he's going to make a Bitcoin national yeah. stockpile. There's some things that are really changing. Um, so Something things are, it. yeah, things are good. Uh, what were you going to say? I think I cut you off there. No, I was just going to say, yeah, some big news. It's been a uh, super interesting to see how crypto has not only just like evolved at the most basic level, but especially on the political front, like this is now a major campaign point for all candidates that yeah. are running. I mean, RFK was there. Trump was there. We see, you know, Biden and Harris talking about this stuff now. Like everyone's talking about this. In fact, I think there's more talk about cryptocurrency and how we want the future of crypto to be more so than what's getting talked about in regards to like maybe even the economy or the national debt or all this stuff. Everyone's focused on crypto. And I'll tell you what, I think a big reason why that's the case is because we know it's the future. We yeah. know it's the future and everyone's trying to pave the way for, uh, I guess, what that future will look like. People don't want to get left out um, on the company level, on the individual level, and now we're seeing it on the state level. But uh, anyhow, yeah, just a lot of interesting things going on, and it, it just continues to to galvanize my uh, my belief in crypto. And, and we've got another crypto junkie here with us today, joining us on the Crypto 101 podcast, somebody who has uh, been working in the Web3 space, somebody who has uh, a breadth of uh, knowledge and information uh, particularly on staking. Uh, and we're going to dive into p2p.org with Alessandro Macchi, uh, who is the senior product manager at P2P. Um, Alessandro, thank you for joining us. How are you doing today? Yeah, thank you for the invite, guys. Yeah, I'm doing great. Thank you for, thank you for the introduction. Yeah, yeah no, it, we're going to have a lot of fun today. Um, and we want to get a little bit of your background. We just want to acquaint you with the audience here before we dive into all the things that you're working on. So, so how'd you end up at P2P and uh, what really got you into crypto in the first place? Yeah, so my journey started, I mean, we're talking about Bitcoin, right? So my actual journey started with the Bitcoin halving, the one in 2020, initially just as a as an investment opportunity, you know, trying to put some money there and wait for, you know, waiting for mooning them. Then um, the thing, you know, started becoming more and more interesting. Um, I started looking also into, into Ethereum. Obviously, you know, it was the second asset in market cap. So I was trying to diversify a bit my, my, my investments there. But that turned out actually to be more than just an investment. You know, it started a whole rabbit hole into, into, into blockchain, into like some of the applications built build on top of that. Uh, got interesting like into some solidity development because back then there was this hype about you know um, whole solidity like easy way to make some to make some money and that actually started this whole process you know of getting more uh, uh, into ethereum getting more into some of the applications joined a couple of hackathons over there and joined a couple of DAOs. Um, i had an amazing experience in index crop i don't know if you guys are familiar they're an incredible team out there building like index yeah, I like products index. yeah they're very big team. And I think all in all this narrative, you know, we're talking like about ETF, you know, like I think they have a very compelling um, position over there. Then also join developer DAO, you know, start building some products over there. And one of them is called WhoopPay, which was my first real products, you know, that turned into, into an actual, in, into just more than just a prototype. Um, so it was very, very exciting journey. Um, and then, uh, yeah, last... Last year, I, I joined P2P uh, as, as, as a product manager. Um, again, and that, that's, that's a whole different story there. Yeah. Awesome. And then just at a high level, um, what is P2P? Because um, I, I, I remember you know, years ago, uh, back when there was LimeWire, right? You know, that was P2P. And then there's <laughs> all sorts of different uh, you know, seeding services, and they're all P2P hosted. And I always just thought it was just you know, peer to peer anything right and so does p2p stand for peer-to-peer -peer and, and what is it 
Yeah. So yeah, I, I have to acknowledge P2P is a very strong name and uh, used a bit everywhere in crypto. Uh, but yeah, it stands for P2P, a peer-to-peer. Uh, so P2P.org is, is basically like a blockchain infrastructure company. Um, it's, we are specialized like in, in staking and data services. We work with like all the major tier one institutions out there coming from both tier uh, ThreadFi and the more crypto native. Um, we support more than 40 different proof of stake chains and uh, I think we have something like 7 billion of TVL. And yeah, we are basically one of the major uh, staking provider in, in the world today. Yeah. yeah, you know, I think the the idea of staking has really evolved in, in recent years. I mean, when we look at what used to be the standard, right, we started with Bitcoin. We didn't start with staking. We started with proof of work. And the longer that staking has been around, the more widely adopted yeah. it's become. Um, I think one of the most notable examples of this was Ethereum making the switch from proof of work to proof of stake. So I'm just curious, you know, can you kind of like walk us through what went into that? And like, I guess even why it's significant, because it really changed the landscape of Ethereum and it also kind of changed the standard um, completely over, in my opinion. At least when you look at modern day altcoins, we don't have a ton of proof of work anymore. Yeah. No, that's a great point uh, there, Brenda, that you mentioned. So, Indeed, uh, when we look at, at Ethereum specifically, and we look at the actually at the initial vision of Ethereum, like the, you know, the whole white paper, like proof of stake was already mentioned there. So proof of stake was since the beginning considered as the natural transitions for, for, for Ethereum. So, but Ethereum didn't start with proof of stake as we, as we all know, you know, it started with like proof of work. And then, um, it came the whole period of like research, you know, before like the beacon chain was launched, which, which basically was this parallel version of Ethereum with proof of stake. There was this whole research in between um, related to the whole consensus mechanism and what was the best way to, to basically adopt proof of stake. So then we had the beacon chain, uh, which again was running in parallel with the, the version of Ethereum with, with, with proof of work until um, I think we're like 2022, where we had the merge. So the merge is basically the moment where Ethereum transitions from proof of work to, to, to proof of stake. And I would say that probably the entire journey closed like last year when we also had with one of the upgrade, um, which now it doesn't, uh, I think it's Capella, where we actually also had the withdrawals enabled because from the moment the merge started until, uh, uh, until like withdrawals were enabled, well, basically, the old users had to trust, they know that the, all the assets they were locking at some point, they were going to be available again for them. So, and, 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 we, and we know it very well because in that period of time, of course, P2P um, started focusing heavily on, on, on Ethereum. And so we had like all these institutions coming to us and with all these, these questions, whether, you know, these assets will be, uh, will be available again and, uh, and then the, the, the all client, Ethereum client teams, they delivered that change. So, so I think really 2023, mm -hmm. I think we had the full transitions to, to, to proof of stake. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, let's even break down what proof of stake is, because I'm sure there's got to be listeners on here that just aren't as familiar with the concept. Um, the whole topic of like passive income when it comes to crypto is constantly being thrown mm -hmm. around. And one of the most popular ways to earn that, you know, quote unquote, passive income is through staking. Now, up until fairly recently, you could only do this to change that were run on proof of stake um, or, or use proof of stake as a consensus mechanism. Now it's kind of cool because we're able to do this for more than just the blockchains that use proof of stake. And we've seen this with Bitcoin and some other blockchains. You know, I want to get into that later. Um but yeah, I mean, I guess just seeing how this is how this has evolved and like how proof of stake has earned its spot in the modern day has been something that's really fascinating to me. And the way that proof of stake is done for every single project is a little bit different. It's you know never the same for for every project. Different projects have different inflation rates. Maybe they have a, a cap supply versus an open supply, and we see it implemented in different ways. So I guess what parts of proof of stake fascinate you the most? And can you also just give us, I guess, like a brief explanation, maybe like a high level overview of, of proof of stake and how it generates that yield? Because a lot of people see the number 
and they just immediately go, oh, this is great. But they don't understand how <laughs> how that yield is generated because it's not just like it's printed out of thin air. Uh, and this is what I like to kind of make the the crossover between like stocks having dividends and then proof of stake because there are you know similarities, but it's not identical. Yeah, it's, uh, there's a lot to unpack there. So let's start indeed from from, from proof of stake. Um, when we talk about proof of stake, we're in general talking about like consensus mechanism. Um, so in, in a simpler term is a way basically on how different entities, they reach an agreement. So in this case, we are talking like computers, we're talking nodes, that they need to reach an agreement on what's that single uh, um, uh, history of, of, of transactions, you know, that, that, that we all agree. Um, and blockchains, you know, they use different different ways to get to that. So proof of stake is 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 is, is one way to do it. Um, I always like to kind of split it into parts. You have the, obviously the economic parts, and then you have the more technical parts. The economic parts consist of, indeed, uh, basically locking up an asset. You're locking up an asset um, so that the, basically the protocol can make sure that you behave in correct way. Because if you don't, then they can use basically the, that assets to slash you. So they can take out part of that asset. So you are essentially incentivized to always behave in a correct way. And then there is the technical part. So by basically locking up those assets, you're essentially qualifying for uh, participating in the, in the, in the consensus, consensus process of the chain, uh, which is a very fundamental part because it basically helps to secure the chain. So validators, basically, what they do at the end of the day, I mean, they help, they, they, they create blocks, they propose blocks, they verify the blocks from, from other parties are correct. They all try to make sure that the, 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 basically the chain is um, as, the, as, as the right information, uh, as the right correct data. And for doing this operation, the protocol rewards you. So that rewards, basically, is what the users at the end, uh, at the end of the day, they get uh, when they stake their assets. Um, and uh, yeah, for um, for a lot of institutions, and because we, because we talk, uh, obviously we talk with them. For them, is often seen as, as as a form of investment. You know, uh, we work with like hedge funds, you know, asset managers, uh, custodies, uh, whatever. They have like their portfolio, and they want to basically have. Um, new types of strategy that returns like like uh, um, like some, some yields, and they look at staking as one of the way. Uh, that's fine. I mean, it, it's obviously seen as an investment, uh, but I will say it's actually more than that. So, by staking your assets, you're actually contributing to the security of the chain. Um, so, um, usually, yeah, we try to to okay, to position it more than just an more than just an investment. Um, and uh, yeah, that's uh, that's that's how I see proof of stake. Um, yeah, yeah, and I got a quick follow up to that. You know, with with running P two P, I mean, you're so ingrained in the staking space. In your experience, do you see more retail people staking or more like institutional staking? Because yeah. that's not something that I've really thought about up until recently. And there was the whole proposed idea of having staking ingrained into the Ethereum ETFs, and now it kind of seems like that's up in the air. But I guess just from surely your experience at P2P, do you feel like you get more retail or institutional traffic? I would say more institutions, because uh, wow. if, if we're considering, let, let's consider like Ethereum staking. You know, if you want to stake natively on the chain, you need a minimum of 32 yeah. ETH, which today is, what, more than 100K USD. And for a lot of people, yeah. it's that's a lot of money. You know, not not everyone can afford that thing. So, and that's where liquid staking then came in as as a way to basically solve that problem, solve that big barrier um, to to basically stake their assets. So most of the retailers are actually looking. We see more looking into liquid staking. P two P as a like more specialized infrastructure provider, staking provider. We work mostly with the institutions, large entity, both coming from ThreadFi. Uh, crypto native custody exchanges. Uh, I mean, you, you 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 name it. I mean, we we work with a lot of them. So yeah. So to answer your questions, most institutions again, retailers are more looking at the, at the liquid part. Yeah, liquid sticking. Yeah, and it makes sense. Um, and so I know Ethereum's like the main one that people stake. Um, there's Solana. There's Near. Yeah. There's Celestia. There's Cosmos, and so on and so forth. Um, what would you say? Are some of the key differences between those staking programs and um, 
you know, is I guess the, the, the question is, is all staking the same? Yeah, that's a good question. Um, I would say that staking is not always the same. I mean, it, at the end of the day, is always, uh, I like to think it as, as, a, as like trade-offs, you know, like each blockchain is making some, some, some choice, some design choice, whether they want, for example, to prioritize um, uh, decentralizations over, for example, like user experience or, or the other way around, or whether they want to, for example, uh, prioritize um, uh, just like s s security over, over speed. So at the end of the day, it's, it's, it's a lot of, uh, it's a lot of trade-offs that, uh, that are coming into play. And that also affects, of course, the yield. I mean, the issuance to the users is very attractive. So when, uh, when you look, for example, at like at Solana returns or like Polkadot, uh, let's, let's see Polkadot, like there you're seeing like what, 18% APR. I mean, that's, that's, that's a big number compared to Ethereum. You know, but there are different mechanisms into play um, that of, often also results into like how much that blockchain basically needs to pay these validators to come into play. Because as we say, like staking is the fundamental. So without those validators, the security is, is at risk. So sometimes it's, it's also a matter indeed of, of um, finding ways to attract more validators. Um, by using the year, by using, for example, higher yields, and uh, yeah, that again at the end comes to comes to uh, how much security you want to provide, and that's why, for example, today we see a lot of interest into restaking. You know, like there are clearly some protocols that found big product market fit over there. So how can we leverage that security in other protocols without bootstrapping something completely new and and basically re almost reinventing the wheel over there? Yeah. Yeah, when it comes to staking, you know, we see it typically tied to a project's inflation rate. Yeah. Um, at least that's how it used to be in the past. And now there's been some like newer, more innovative ways to get that reward from staking. You know, some of these projects have profit sharing. Um, some of them do go the the normal route of taking it out of the supply and inflating the supply and re and rewarding the people who are staking with that. Um, so I'm just curious to get your thoughts, you know, like how does staking relate to a project's inflation rate? Because I think that's one of the most overlooked aspects of staking is sometimes people go, I know this happened a lot in, in the previous cycle, but people saw a project that was getting 20% um, APY from staking or 25% or these big numbers, you know, 15%. Um, and they think that that looks great because they're like, oh, I, this thing can appreciate just like any other crypto, plus I'm getting 20% yield. Um, but in reality, those ones that are getting the the bigger yields, whether that's double digits, 10, 20, 30, 40 percent, um, they often have the higher inflation rate. And that's why the staking rewards are so much higher. And again, that's not always the case nowadays. Again, we see some projects doing profit sharing and, and other stuff to reward people. But I'm curious about your thoughts on like that sector. Yeah. Let me. Yeah, I would say, Brent, from. Uh if, if we look like at, at, at the ecosystem, I think staking is one of those crypto uh, products or services that really achieved product market fit. It's probably one, one, one of the few cases. Like you have a set of um, uh, clients and users that are very interesting into staking. So for a lot of projects, uh, I can understand that this also comes as, as, as a way to yeah, attract like the first, uh, uh, let's say, um, the first group of users into a project by uh, by promising them like some some very high rewards. Like we see this coming the user acquisition cost exactly. We, we see this coming so often into play. But again, as as you mentioned, I ag agree with your point. Like this again, and that's why I, I was always like to think in terms of trade off. What are you trading off? Inflation is 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 one example, which in the end, you know, is basically the value. Um, that the users are going to pay in terms of like token token price. So uh, those two things are strictly related. And to me, it's so kind of obvious the natural progression that now we see with with restaking. You know, in basically reusing the security into into other projects. So th those projects they don't need to worry about this thing. They don't need to worry anymore about indeed user acquisitions, uh, how to find like the old tech tokenomics. There are clearly some projects out there that that achieve that that balance. So let's just reuse it so that we can focus on uh, on the tech, we can focus on the user experience. So um, yeah, this 
kind of makes sense. Okay, it clicks to me. Yeah. yeah, and so you're kind of talking about um, like Eigenlayer and some of these platforms. Is that right? Where other projects don't need to focus on making their own staking program, but they could just kind of leverage Ethereum's uh, security that's derived from that staking. Is that right? Absolutely. I would say even more than that. Let's look at the, I mean, and a very hot topic in staking right now is Bitcoin staking. I mean, obviously, mm -hmm. as you say, Bitcoin is about proof of work, right? So there is no staking in part. I see that as a restaking because now users have the ability to basically use their BTC to um, basically validate some, some other proof of stake chains out there. So it's it's kind of form of restaking, staking. I think that depends on how you like to 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 see it. But uh, but yeah, you got you got Aiken layers, perfect example as well. Yeah, tell us a little bit more about uh about Bitcoin staking. You know, we had uh, the founder of Babylon uh, onto the show recently. Um, but for those who who maybe didn't catch that episode and they're like, hold on, Bitcoin's proof of work. What do you mean we could stake this and earn a yield? Um, I know people have heard of uh, of stacks where you could kind of stake your stacks tokens and earn Bitcoin, but how do you, you know, how do you stake your Bitcoin and, and earn a yield on it? Yeah. I mean, if you guys are the founder, I mean, I'm sure he, he, he has explained this much, much better than me, but um, <laughs> let, let, let me give it a try. Um, so to me, the, the, again, the, the easier way to understanding it is to start from the fundamentals. You know, when we are trying to, when, when we are talking proof of stake, what we are trying to achieve basically is a way to, incentivize you as a stakers to behave correctly, or in this case, like you as a validators to behave correctly. So we need to find a way basically to one, you lock your assets, but we can also penalize you by slashing some of the assets if you behave bad. So how can we do that? Basically, uh, by the way, when we talk about Bitcoin staking, I think we're mostly referring to Babylon, uh, their project, I think they are the ones that gain the most traction out there. So even though the old Bitcoin scripting is, has, has some limitation, it still allows to do some, some operation out there. So you can basically create a Bitcoin transactions. You can also specify like a lock time. So you can basically say, okay, in this, in this amount of time, this, this, um, uh, these assets are locked. And then you can also specify, you can basically pre-sign a transactions, which can do two things. Either it returns the asset to yourself, Second one, it sends the assets to a fake, to basically, um, yeah, let's say a fake address, like a zero, zero, zero. Basically, you're burning those assets. And just by doing this, basically, we have enabled slashing. Because right now, if you behave in a malicious way, the protocol can basically take that transaction you pre-signed and that you're sending to some inexisting address to basically penalize you. So that's how basically the old Bitcoin staking came into play is basically by leveraging this, these, two, these, two, um, uh, these two elements into play. And then the next question is, okay, what are we going to use this Bitcoin for? Again, the whole point is to basically secure a chain. Um, at first, Babylon will use it to secure like its own chain, like Babylon is a Cosmos SDK chain. But uh, I think, um, no, not I think, I mean, they, they say for them the vision is actually to, to make that as a way to validate like all the all the major proof of stake chains out there, uh, of course starting from other Cosmos SDK chains, but I think they will probably want to extend it to to much more than that. With Babylon sort of sitting in between, becoming a sort of control plane in in, in there. Um, but I think it's a very it's a very innovative way, um, and obviously P2P is you know is participating in all the all the test net, anxiously waiting for the main net and everything. And, uh, and we also start seeing like the interest from institutions. Again, Bitcoin is the first, um, it's the first crypto assets. So if we look just at the, at just the, from, uh, um, from, from a capital perspective, so a lot of institutions are there. They want to increase capital efficiency for the assets. So there, there is a lot of excitement, a lot of hype for, uh, for Bitcoin staking for sure. Yeah. And if we kind of just go back uh, to, to P2P particularly, um, what's the difference between if I used P2P or if I just directly staked the assets uh, on the website or um, in some other capacity, what are some of the big benefits of using P2P? Yeah, uh, just to just to, to make sure I understood the questions compared to uh, basically uh, staking on 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 your own, like as a solo staker or or with competitors. Correct. Uh, yeah. 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 I mean, actually, yeah, with both, I guess. Indeed. Um, yeah. Let, let me start with the solo stakers. 
Um, in some in some chains, I mean, being a solo staker is 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 very complex because um, you need to have like more than just some consumer hardware machine out there. Like you need to have some um, yeah very high spec kind of kind of a machine to to basically keep up with the level of uh, um, of of connectivity and 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 capacity that the network demands. So in some cases. Mm-hmm. This is not even possible, except you are, except in the case you are like P2P, like a specialized infrastructure provider. We, we basically do this job for like over 10 years. You know, we we have more than uh, what 100 people working. So, it of course it has some 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 uh, some differences in, in there. Um, in some specific chains, I'm thinking for example like in Polygon, you, you also need to have like um, you need to be part of like a specific set of of, of entities. So my whole point is that in some cases, solo staking is not even an option in, in, in a lot of the chains out there. When we look at, at Ethereum, for example, where solo staking is not just an option, it's actually the preferred way. I mean, the ecosystem encourages people to become solo staker because Ethereum wants to become this global settlement, credible, neutral, decentralized, censorship resistant. So the more solo stakers you have, the more you are basically aligned with, with, with that narrative. Um, the problem comes, again, uh, we discussed before, partly is capital. You need to have 32 ETH to become uh, solo stakers. That's unattainable for a lot of people. Um, but what we see more is that actually the more specialized you are, actually the more rewards you can ex- extract. If we talk about MEV, um, that's one example. Um, there are, there are say, techniques and ways you can extract the more rewards. So um, Some of the advantages often indeed comes to uh, higher yields and the fact that you don't need to run your your own machine, which again, even in that case, comes with with quite some challenges. Think about software upgrades. Think about like debugging if there is an issue. Um, yeah, it's, it, it's not as as simple as as I think the Ethereum community wants to be. Uh, and maybe at some point we will get there. Yeah. Yeah, it sounds like you're really trying to make it as easy and accessible as possible. Uh, to the masses and to the new people are, that are coming in here. And I think that's been one of the the big pushing points for the crypto space and everyone that is building behind the scenes is saying, how can we make this as, as seamless as possible to the masses when the next wave of adoption does come? Um, and this is a great way of doing that. You know, it's kind of getting everyone that could be involved in staking and verifying uh, the network to be able to do that and having them have like a centralized place where they can kind of come and see everything and understand it without having to know all the intricacies um, that would go into this stuff normally behind the scenes, uh, which I think is really, really useful. Um, the other thing is that we're constantly seeing all sorts of technology and, and blockchain evolve. And I'm curious if you've seen any kind of like new trends or, or maybe different forms of technologies when it specifically comes to the staking front. You know, I know on, on your website, you've talked about uh, MEV relays and DVT staking and an eigenlayer uh, restaking, um, but can you kind of just walk us through, I guess, what those are, and also if there's anything else that, when it comes to the staking front, that you've noticed or maybe that's stood out to you? Yeah, yeah I'll try to share some alpha with uh, <laughs> with you guys, with all the audience. Hopefully, uh, get some uh, some some good content out there. Um, yeah, perfect. Let me let, let me first um, kind of. Make 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 a note. I think on on, on P2P and and a why indeed why is trying to push so much on this technology. I think yeah. from from last year there was a clear direction like how our company like like took. We wanted to be basically become like an an innovator leader, like a technology leader. Um, our goal is of of course to to provide like the best return strategy to to our clients, and the way to do that was through technologies. So that's why we invested so heavily like into new technologies. <clears throat> of course, like Ethereum was a perfect playground because <clears throat> starting from last year, with whole withdrawals enabled, with like eigenlayer coming to play, there was like a lot of room to play. So um, I think the if we're talking of trends, the most probably mentioned one is obviously eigenlayer. We talk about restaking before, right? How Restaking basically helps to basically take the security from Ethereum and and put it on top of like, <clears throat> or let's say make it available for applications that are not built on Ethereum, which was the initial limitations, right? 
But what for a lot of people actually that, that translating into was this additional rewards and now you can have on top of that Ethereum yield. Of course, that all started with some Hagen points and, and everything. So we saw a lot of interest coming from that. For, as, we, as we say before, Ben, like we work a lot with institutions, right? So that's our primary target. And even from institution side, there was so much interest into that, like into understanding the technology and understanding how, how they can leverage that, how they can include it into their portfolio or, or um, yeah, they, just, their, just their products, basically. So that definitely was the, was the highest, uh, highest topic. And P2P positioned so well in, in, into that. Uh, I think at some point we reached like 20% market share, which is huge which is huge. We wow. support like all the AVSs out there. So that strategy played out so well. And now we are looking into basically the next phase of Ethereum. Um, I don't know if you guys heard, like basically last week, Hagenlayer announced like that rewards might come into play because after all, Hagen points, hair drops. Now the real question is when rewards are coming, right? So the announcement said seems like rewards are actually coming. We're expecting like some further um, timelines like I think this week, hopefully. So basically now all the restakers can start, uh, they can expect finally time where they actually get these extra rewards, which, which was basically a big reason why a lot of people participated. So that's a big, big news coming from, from restaking. I would say another one still in restaking is about symbiotic. Um, that's, it seems like it's, it's coming, it's positioning as the major competitor of, of Hagen Layer, which again, if we consider Hagen Layer as like 4.8 million of ETH staked, that's huge. So being the major competitor, of course, that's, I, I'm, I'm sure it's going to play out very, very well. <laughs> They're going to play with something like, um, I think their narrative is about like customization, flexibility. So they are there. That's how they're trying to differentiate. So as P2P, of course, we are also looking into, into symbiotic. And um, yeah, another trend <clears throat> that I think this probably didn't reach the same level of, of attention as Egan Layer, but at least for the for the say the, the people in the space in, in staking, there was also a big one was DVT, distributed validator technology. Um, uh, basically, it represents like an extra security heading on top of validator. So from um, basically having like your node being, sorry, your validator being secured from by one entity, suddenly you can have the same validator being secured by multiple entities at the same time. So imagine the case where that entity goes offline, then you don't need to worry about it because there are three others at least that, um, that can keep basically maintaining your validator online. And for us, that was like a big game changer. Um, so we start, again, investing very heavily. We, we work very closely with SSV which is one of the team that first enabled DVT. And again, even in that case now, I think P2P has like 33% market share. There are some incredible like incentive pro program these guys offer. Um, we see Obol, which is another team also gaining tractions. We see Lido um, starting like to, to, to adopt more um, these DVT um, protocols, both SSV and Obol. So this is definitely like also another big trends uh, we see. And believe me, like a lot of institutions are looking into that as well. Incredible. Is there something that you feel like is missing from staking that you want to see? You know, maybe it's something that you're actively working on or something that you want to see happen um, that is yet to come to the staking front. That's a good question. Um, I would say at this moment, I think the if we're talking about of, of, uh, of Ethereum staking, at least, uh, I think the, the whole ecosystem will benefit from some um, sort of like more stability. So we obviously had these projects, you know, like whole uh, launching and, and, and making like very uh, intensive, like user acquisitions campaigns and, and, and everything. But now we, not, we, we need to see them like, you know, like solidifying and becoming like more secure. Like again, Eigenlayer is not a finalized project, you know, rewards are still not there. We still need to see indeed how the whole um, ecosystem will play when slashing, for example, from, from Eigenlayer will be enabled. So. I think right now the ecosystem will benefit from some more stability time where we have the time to, again, solidify, battle test the whole, all, all these projects and everything. And um, if we're looking at the current ecosystem in general, I think the, the biggest challenge right now that the, 
the old Ethereum staking space uh, has is probably in the centralization of the block production. Um, when it comes to basically, uh, let's so if we think about Ethereum, you know, like the whole positioning, you know, they want to become again this global settlers, censorship resistant, decentralized, and blah blah blah. The problem right now is that the block creation doesn't really happen on the validator side. I mean, they are the ones that, okay, in the end they do it, but the whole block gets created by some off-chain entities. And these off-chain entities today are very centralized. You have like a few that have a bigger control of over the whole block production. So, and a lot of these entity apply censorship. Um, they do it for offer compliance, blah, blah, blah. So right now, the whole position of Ethereum it doesn't really match reality because we have a lot of this censorship happening. So I think from a, yeah. from an ecosystem perspective, that's probably the biggest challenge. And there are some some initiatives, Ethereum foundations are looking into that, and we are also, of course, looking into that, trying to contribute, trying to bring our perspective into into this. Yeah, no, it makes total sense. Um, it's something that hopefully gets figured out. Um, there's a lot of very technical components to that, and some political components and stuff. So. It's definitely a big discussion, but um, I guess my, my last question while we still have you, Alessandro, is um, kind of just taking a look at Bitcoin versus Ethereum. It's kind of a question we like to pose to folks every now and again. Um, do you think that uh, you know Ethereum's proof of stake will launch it to be the number one crypto mm -hmm. and Bitcoin's proof of work is kind of dragging it down and it might become the number two or the number three crypto? Yeah, tough one. <laughs> Um, <laughs> if we look um, um, again, if, if 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 I think about like the whole pre-merge time, you know, there was a lot of discussions around like where the proof of stake was better than proof of work. Uh, what were some of the advantages? You know, all the discussions or like like issuance, the old uh, um, um, uh, uh, energy consumptions and everything. If I look at today. There is no more discussions about it. It seems like the mm -hmm. ecosystem has kind of settled on, okay, some blockchains are using proof of stake because it has some advantages, but we still have proof of work because Bitcoin doesn't like changes so much. And because Bitcoin is the first crypto assets in the world, proof of work is, is, is inevitable to, to consider proof of work. So even if there are some um, advantages, I would say looking at proof of stake over proof of work, um, just because of of Bitcoin, it's I think it's inevitable that 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 will uh, uh, that will remain into the discussions. Now, whether the proof of stake will become the the, the number one, I think it really depends like on, on the blockchains. I think for me it's the same question as as it does Ethereum. Will Ethereum become the number one assets in the world? Very difficult to say, um, but. Um, at least, I think from my side, what, what I can say is that, again, there is not much more discussions on around this. So it seems like proof of work and proof of stake became the default options. And uh, yeah, what will happen in the future, I guess, yeah, we'll just see. Yeah, nobody has the crystal ball, unfortunately. <laughs> um, but no, this is, this was awesome, Alessandro. We, we, we deeply appreciate you coming on to the show and, and sharing your viewpoint and all the amazing things you're working on. Lastly, where can people find out more? Where can people follow you? And uh, we'll link to some of these links in the show notes as well. Yeah, I think you could guys definitely like check our website, like p2p.org. It's very simple. Uh, we are very active on Twitter most of the time. You can also find me on Twitter. I use the handle alerex.it. Um, so yeah, those are some of the main channels. We have our blogs. Uh, we are also very active conferences. So if you guys are coming like in Singapore, talking 2049, we'll be there. You will find us with some nice swag. Happy to, happy to also yeah, share it with everyone there. So yeah, awesome. Well, thank you so much, Alessandro, and everybody at home watching. Thanks for listening. Uh, come on back, same time, same place next week, and we're gonna have another incredible guest for you. All right, take care. 